Okay, does everybody have their lab guide? No. Yes, sir. How many people do not? One, two, three, four, five. Um, well, <laughs> it probably is. While I'm at it, um, how many people plan on buying a textbook still from the bookstore? No? How many people plan on buying the lab guide still for the bookstore? Just one? Everybody else is two? Everybody else is going to be getting them like from Amazon? Yeah. Okay, because I don't want to go have the bookstore buy them and then not. Um, yeah, is it not in there? Well, not five, well, not one of those. Kind of right. Okay, well, we'll go on. I can just bring one from over there. Um, yeah, yeah, do that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so for the five people who don't have them today, I will give you a photocopy after I finish with the introduction. But we can't do that throughout the year because of honesty, right? It would be, even though I think we could all agree that the book companies are not really charging an honest and fair price for the books, it's still dishonest to steal from them by just photocopying everything and not buying the stuff that they have produced because people worked. You know, they do need to get paid. So I will photocopy for today, but in the future, you need to have it your own book, not just, you know, well, I photocopied from a friend and stole still. I can't, you know, can't support theft. <clears throat> so I just want to make it clear on that and not have people, you know, I think it would be a problem. I had a copy. Today, what we're going to be doing is looking at the relationship between your motion and graphs of that motion. And so we have a few things that we need to learn about, some new words to do it. This is part of chapter one, but it's the last part of chapter one, so I obviously didn't get to it in class yesterday. So this is from the end part of the lecture notes. So the first thing is position. Now position's a really simple term. I believe everyone here will be comfortable with, you know, position is the location something is that. So we're going to be using these things here, motion sensors. Um, our lab guy calls them sonic rangers. It's supposed to be a little bit funny, but it also makes sense because it's using sound to determine the range. Range is another word for distance away something is. So what these do is they send out a little chirp of sound. You can't hear it, it's at an inaudible pitch. What you can hear is when it turns on and off the sound. So you hear it go click, 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 but that click is not the sound that it's using for determining distance. It's just turning on and off the speaker. But it's gonna send sound out. Sound will reflect off of whatever the most convenient object is and reflect back. And it also has a microphone and it measures the time that it took from when it sent out the signal to when the signal returned. And based on that time, and the speed of sound in air, which is 344 meters per second. A meter is the standard unit distance. A meter is, instead of putting my hands too close together, these are meter sticks. So a meter is this long. The meter was originally, divide, originally defined based on the distance from the North Pole to the equator along the prime meridian. And I think the idea was it was supposed to be 10,000 kilometers from the North Pole to the Prime Meridian. And so they took the distance as determined by the best surveyors, divided by 10,000, and said that's one kilometer. Kilo is a prefix that means thousand. So they take that number divided by thousand, it gives you the meter. This distance was at one point just etched on a piece of a bar of platinum iridium metal and kept it at constant temperature, and they said, that's a meter. If you want to check, you'd have to come and check. Is this the same length as those two marks? Well, that's a really poor way of defining anything. Not quite as bad as the foot, because the foot used to be, mm, how long is that baby? That's a foot. Of course, you have to use a reference. So the king, let's use the king's foot. But what happens when you get a new king? The foot changes. That's a pretty bad reference. And was it the yard? Was the distance from the king's nose to his outstretched fingers? You know, silly definitions because they change when the person changes. 
These days, we actually use the speed of light as a constant. The speed of light is 29979245 meters per second. And the distance per meter is the distance that light and vacuum travels um, in, well, it's actually X number of wavelengths for a specific um, emission band from sodium. It's a scientific definition, but it's something that can be determined anywhere in, in the world. So what, how is this important to us? We're going to be measuring distance. What are the units of distance? It's in the metric system. Meters. And this will determine that distance with the time delay. It doesn't tell you the time delay. It just calculates it for you. And so when I'm close, it'll be a small distance. When I'm farther away from that, it'll be a bigger distance. And so the position is going to be that distance. And so my position will be how far away from it I am. Based on that position, we then can go to what speed is. So position has units of meters. The symbol for meter is just M. Speed, as is shown on the top of this slide, is the rate of change in position. Rate of change means I'm going to take how much something changes. In this case, it's the rate of change of position. So how much position changes per unit time. So these words, rate of change in position, translate into an equation that is change in position divided by change in time. What are the units for position? Meters. So this is going to have units of, and on top I'm going to have meters. <clears throat> what are the units for time? Seconds. seconds. So it has units of meters per second. Those aren't the units you're used to using. If you're driving your car, what units do you use? Miles per hour. Miles, per hour. Miles is distance. Hour is time. And so you can convert... If you know how many meters are in a mile, so 1,609 meters in a mile, that's you know, rounded off. But, and you know how many seconds are in an hour, 3,600 seconds in an hour, then you can say one mile per hour, which is one mile over one hour, and use my conversion factor. Since I have miles on top, I'm going to make a conversion factor that has miles on bottom so that the two will cancel. And what unit do I want for my distance? Meters. So I'm going to put meters on top. And I said 1,609 meters is one mile. So my conversion factor, the thing that's inside parentheses, actually has a value of one. Because 1,609 meters divided by one mile is equal to one. And so that's going to take care of my miles portion. Now I take care of the hours. Hours are on the bottom here, so where do I need the hours in my conversion factor? On top. And on bottom, the unit I want it in is seconds. And we know one hour is how many seconds? 3,600. 3, and so I can take this and multiply through. I have one mile per hour is equal to... And I'm going to show the canceling, mile and mile canceled, hour and hour canceled. So I'm left with 1609 meters over 3600 seconds. And let's see, I have now two calculators. One of them's got to work. 1609 divided by 3600. <laughs> I put it in wrong in my calculator, um, is it's close to four ninths, 0 0.4469 meters per second. Four ninths would have been 0 0.44 forever. That's very close, right? 
So that's how we find the conversion so we can relate miles per hour to meters per second to a good approximation that's just cutting it in half. So if I'm doing 20 miles per hour, I'm doing about 10 meters per second. Obviously it's not exactly, but it gives you an idea. So those are the units of speed. Speed, the rate of change in position over time, <laughs> distance covered over travel time is what it shows from the textbook equation. In physics, we don't like to use words. I bet you prefer words over symbols, don't you? In physics, we prefer symbols over words because we memorize the symbol so it carries the same meaning, but it takes less writing to get it out there. And so the symbol we use for speed is a V. So V is speed. And you're probably wondering, why would V equal speed? There's no V in speed. Velocity. The V stands for velocity. So what's the difference in speed and velocity? Do you know, Eric? No. Since you knew the word, I was thinking maybe you did. Does anybody know the difference in speed and velocity? Speed is how fast you're traveling. Velocity is how fast you're traveling and the direction you're traveling. So when I'm walking away from this, I have a speed of, let's say, three meters per second, and I have a direction of that way, which would be north. And so my velocity is three meters per second north, while my speed is just three meters per second. So that's the difference in velocity and speed. Now in our labs today, I'm not sure if your lab guide uses the word speed or velocity, but we're moving only in one direction. We're gonna either be moving away or toward the sensor. When we're moving away, the distance is getting bigger and we'll call that the positive direction. So our velocity, we'll just use positive for the direction. So walking away, my velocity will be positive something. 49ers? <laughs> no, no need to be. No. She's totally joking. Out here, I usually teach people about being fans of teams with better records than me. Although this year, we had a better record than everyone. Anyway, walking toward it, the distance is getting smaller, so that's going to be our negative direction. So we'll call it a negative velocity when going toward the detector. So velocity has direction and speed, whereas speed is, well, speed. Now, the distance covered, the words I used below, instead of distance covered, I said change in position. In physics, we have a symbol for change in. And that symbol is a capital Greek delta. So I put delta for change in, change in position, over change in time. Actually, I didn't need that line to be nearly so long. For position, oh, this is, gets fun. X is the symbol we use for position. So delta X, when I write that down, my brain says change in position. Yours at this point doesn't, I'm guessing. And so that's part of the things we need to learn. Yes. So delta just means change in blank? Yes. Okay. And in fact, it's a little more specific. Delta change in means final minus initial. So this would be the position final minus the position initial. So change in is very specific on it's the final minus initial. Over the time, so over delta T. So that's what speed is. It's the rate of change in position. It's the delta X over delta T, and somewhere along the line, I want you to get familiar with these symbols. I'll say words like change in position over change in time, and then I'll write symbols like delta X over delta T. And if you're not familiar, well, you all know that leads to frustration. So something to learn. We are today only going to be exploring this aspect. We're only going to be looking at graphs of position versus time. So let's consider I don't have enough space here. 
let's consider a graph where I put time. On graphs, you always need to show what is on each axis along with the units you're using. So I can have time in seconds, and we'll have it, you know, 0, 1, 2, and so on. And on the vertical axis, we have position. What units should I have for position? Mm -hmm. Meters. And so once again, we'll have 0, 1, 2, 3. Our graph should have titles, and the title of the graph should tell you what the graph is about. Now, some people learn to put position versus time graph. That is an absolutely useless title. Please don't ever do that. Because all you have to do is look at the two axes. You know it's position versus time. What's the point of the graph? That's what the title should tell us. So the title should say, okay, this is a graph of dead man walking. Okay, teacher instead of dead man. Graph of the teacher walking. Then you know, aha, that's what the situation is. We had the, the dude up there walking around. A Biden, so to speak. And so let's say I walk. And let's suppose that I have a path like this to describe my motion on the graph. A straight line. And if I ask you to find the speed at which I'm walking, how would you find the speed? Change position. Do you have a question? Where's that to answer? No, yeah. Okay. Change of position over time. So delta x over delta t. So if I look at this graph, I could, for instance, say, okay. Here was a time of 10 seconds, and here's a time of 0 seconds. And my position I'd have like that. And so just dividing that out, that's 0 0.27 meters per second. But what does it look like if I take the change in position? Notice the position is the vertical aspect over the change in time. What do we usually call that for graph? We take the change in the height divided by the change in the horizontal, the slope. So this is equal to the slope. So if you have a graph of position versus time, which is what we're going to be making today, the slope of that graph is going to give you your speed. So if you have a positive speed, what is that going to tell you about the graph? It's going up. And if it's a negative speed, it's going down. What if you're going faster? More inclined, steeper. Going slower, flatter. That's the whole goal for you to learn in today's lab those distinctions. Now a couple more important things. What we're really finding here is the average speed because I took it over a finite difference in time. If I want the instantaneous speed, like when you're driving your car, it actually gives you the speed you have right now, not the average speed over the last 50 meters. What I need to do is shrink down the time over which I'm making that measurement until I get to making it just a point. Well, on the graph, that's easy. On the graph, if my motion was something like this, and I said, okay, what's the speed at this instant? You just find the slope. Okay, that missed completely. You find the slope right at that point, and that will give you the speed at the instant. We call that the instantaneous speed. Whereas if you take you know, the average going from here to here, that, okay, I missed again, but you get the idea. That would be an average speed. It's not the speed I'm going at any instant per se, but it's the average over that interval. So that's the difference in an instantaneous versus an average speed. <laughs> it's nice that I put it a blank page there. 
Um, where's the last thing I want? Okay, the last thing I want for today before we get to how we're doing the experiment is acceleration. So acceleration is, well, it says up the top, I'm not going to repeat the words since it says them right here, the rate at which velocity changes with time. What did rate mean? Speed was the rate of change in position with time. Rate was how quickly it changes. And so acceleration is how quickly the velocity is changing. So if your velocity is constant, how quickly is it changing? It's not changing. So if your velocity is constant, that means the acceleration is zero. What does constant velocity mean? It means two different things put together. Go ahead. Okay, it means the two things is going at a constant speed and a constant direction. So as long as I'm at a constant speed and direction, my acceleration is zero. But if I walk at a constant speed but I change direction, I change my velocity because it changed from one direction to another, and so I have to accelerate to change direction. Likewise, if I speed up, I change velocity. If I slow down, I change velocity. So all of those are accelerations. Now, if we look at the units for acceleration, because it's we use the symbol A for acceleration, change in. Now, here's something fun. How do we how do we specify the difference in velocity versus speed with an arrow? If it has an arrow, that means it has direction. It's a vector. So a V with a line over it is correctly referred to as the velocity. A V without a line over is the speed. And so the acceleration vector is the change in velocity vector divided by time. Units. What are the units of speed? Meters per second. And what are the units of time? So a lot of times when people say the units, they will say, meters okay that's what i always say they'll say meters per second per second because it's how much the speed in meters per second is changing per second but mathematically if you take meters per second divided by seconds you get exactly what brandon said you get meters per second squared when you look at that if you look at it too long, it won't make sense. Because what is a second squared? Meaningless, right? There's no such thing as a second squared. But if you remember that it's the rate at which the speed is changing, it makes sense. And the meters per second per second helps you to keep that in perspective. But since it's mathematically written as meters per second squared, I get used to saying it that way. Any questions before I go to the actual experiment? Okay, then let's go to the actual experiment. For the actual experiment, and this is risky, I uh, didn't start anything up or even connect it yet. We're using our PASCO software and this CAT PASCO universal interface. PASCO, Paul A. Stockstead Company, is owned by Seventh-day Adventist Paul Stockstead. He uh, used to go to the same church as my uncle and aunt. He gives me a good discount, so I always like to give him a little plug um, because of the church connection. And so I ran the Capstone software on the computer. We tried to get Capstone started on everybody's computer. Uh, hopefully it's running. <laughs> I got to connect my USB here and turn this on. I'm almost ready to go. I need to open my experiment. Now, I planned on making one specifically for you, but I didn't get around to it. So we're going to use the one that's in the Physics 111 folder on your laptop. So grab your laptop and just follow along with me. So you should have a folder on the desktop that says PHYS. Uh-oh. I got a problem. 
I don't have that. You should have one that says PHYS space 111, right? Okay, on the desktop of the computer. So if you hide the window that's open, you find the desktop, you should have one that says PHYS 111. Um, no. <laughs> no. What, what I'm going to do is. Uh, So you're opening, double clicking on the one that says introduction to motion. And it's going to take me a few moments to log in and move that file over so I can access it as well. I forgot that I didn't have access to that. Whoops. It's coming up. So, does everybody have that started up? Yes. 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 These, these aren't super super quick. Yeah. No, I'll do it again. It's just slow. Yeah. Let you get like five minutes. Right. This is why we were in here working on them before we came in to try to make sure they would all work. So you guys got yours out. I think we have all that I can get going right now, and I am now in a position in a change of speed to put this where I can access it. Uh, open a new window. Oh, God bless America. I'm not sure why, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mock my whistling. Okay, show up intro to motion. I put it there. Um, because it's not on here yet, and I just put it to this location because it's on a different computer. <laughs> We're working as quickly as. I mean, we've got time. Yeah, we got time. Fortunately, the experiment's really short, but I hate waiting around for things. Now <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> Drive. I don't know how computers can be this slow, but it slays me. Okay. <laughs> if there's any love in this world at all, it'll show up here in just a moment. There it is. Okay. So here we have Capstone. Another instance is running because, of course, I double clicked it. Okay, so you're just going to stick with this one view, the tab one. And you'll notice that we have time on the horizontal axis. axis. It says prediction time because of some other things I had in there. Position on the vertical. I'm going to show you a few things just on how to use this. So number one, the hardware setup shows me that I have this interface and that I have my motion sensor connected. If I needed to calibrate the motion sensor, I would click that little gear and the speed of sound is what you do to calibrate it. But we're just going to leave that as it is. This graph will graph down here at the bottom where it says motion sensor 20 hertz. That's telling me how much data is taking per second. So it's taking 20 pieces of data per second. If I click record, it starts taking data. So let's just have a volunteer come help me. Brittany, you're the closest. Come help me. Now, following the instructions of the lab guide, I'm going to take this and adjust it. It has a picture of a person and a cart on top. Which one do you suppose Brittany is? All right. So I flip it over to the person position. I'm going to place this here. And Brittany, you need to walk so that you are right in front of it. And so you are a little to the left of it. There you go. And now I'm going to hit start. And now she moves. Okay, I stopped it already. <laughs> Thank you. And it plotted her position as a function of time. So we can look at that and we can see, ah, there's Brittany's motion. Now, for the second half of the experiment where it says to draw the graphs, I'm going to have you print the graphs instead of draw them. And so I'm going to show you how to print the graphs. Now, the first thing when you print the graphs is we want your data that's important to be what fills the graph. Now, there is a function here, the top left corner. Can you see where my pointer is up here? If I click that one in the top left corner, it rescales it so all of the data I took fills the graph. That's a good start, but I started it before Brittany started moving. And so I'm going to take this so I have a hand on the graph and move the graph over. So I cut that part out because I didn't care about it. Try, okay, moving that out of the way. Now I'm going to adjust the time scale. If I um, click on the numbers, I can change the scale so I fill it. And now I have just the data on the screen. So now I say, ah, I'm going to print this. For printing, you won't be able to tell, but this is the picture of a camera up here. See the black icon? So I'm going to click on the arrow, if I can, with my pencil. 
And that brings up three options for what kind of pictures can take. A snapshot of the entire workbook page will it'll have all the stuff on the sides and the top of the page. I don't want that. The one in the middle snapshot of the workbook page content, that will be just the displays. Or I can do snapshot of the workbook page display. Since I only have one display, the bottom two are identical. If I had two displays, it would be different. So it doesn't matter which one for today because we only have one display, so I'll leave it on the middle one. To take a picture, I now click on the camera icon. You see it popped up to show me it took a picture. Well, how do I know if it's a good picture? I click the button right next to it, and it brings up over here an ever-growing window showing me my pictures. And then I can click on this, um, double-click, and there's my picture in all of its glory. And I say, ah, yes, that's what I wanted. Um, don't print it at this point. Don't do that either. What did I just do? No. I hit the red X, which deleted it. Yeah, so don't do that. Got it? Fortunately, I can take another picture. And I click here to annotate it, and I'm going to say that. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's not Richard. It's Brittany. I'm such an egotistical person. I Uh-oh. I spelled Brittany, Brittany. Yeah, Why? Right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't, you know, like E-E-J-Y, you know. <laughs> there, there are those people. Um, okay, so there I put a name to it. When I print it out, I'll have that name. So there's my first picture. Then we go through, and each person needs to make their own graph. We want each person to do each step. So you're going to be working in groups of two, but we want each person to do it, not just one person to do it and say, yeah, we got it. Just to get everybody the experience. So you want to label it, you know, this is Brandon's and Vanessa's, and Brandon's and Vanessa's, and Vanessa's and Brandon's as you go through. Um, I'm going to close that journal now. It's still there. Look, yeah, it's still there. Close the journal. Other things to keep in mind here, if you're looking for numbers, you can find numbers by first click on the data. I made that mistake yesterday. Um, this little button with the pencil and the dots will make a window for selecting data. So here I'm selecting data here. I can change the size of the window so I select more or less. And then this one that has a sigma turns on the statistics. So right now I have it just showing the average value in that window. I can also have it show me by clicking on the little arrow, the maximum, the minimum, the standard deviation. So that's how you get statistics. What if I want to know the slope, right? Because what does the slope represent? The average. the average speed. So if I want to find the slope, I click on the line thing here, turn on the linear fit, and now it's showing me here. In that window, the slope was 1.16. What are the units? Meters per second. I look at the axes to see that it was meters per second. So Brittany was walking at 1.16 meters per second in that, in that time period, yes. And I can, you know, choose a bigger range and you see 1.32 because she was increasing her speed. What do we call her? She's increasing her speed? Acceleration. An acceleration. Okay, so that's how this works. I can turn, notice the graph, the, the, the fit was already turned on, but no fit type was chosen. So I chose the fit type. If I click this to make it gray instead of blue, it turned off the fit. So that's all you really need to know for using the software today. The last couple things, finding the average, finding the slope, are things I don't think you're going to use, but you might want to. So at this point, you're ready to get going. You have two people per group. So you know we have a number of tables with three people. You have to decide, OK, one an odd person out. You know. And we have a total of nine stations for you. And yes, you're doing the entire lab. So starting with, and notice under um, part A, or excuse me, under procedure on the first page, it actually asks you a question. Page 11. Yeah, page 11. 
and ask you a question about how close and how far can it reliably collect data. So to do that, you'll want to have somebody walk really close and then walk far away, making sure that you're staying in the path and seeing over what range is collecting reliable data. When you get too far away, it'll just go flat instead of falling. When you get too close, it'll go flat instead of falling. So make sure you answer that there. It doesn't have a place for you to answer, but ask the question, and I want you to answer. I don't want anyone to turn it in and then say, I didn't realize there was a question there. Where are we? On page 11. Page 11, the end of procedure just above part A. That's where it has the question about how close and far can you go. Then you turn to the next page, and it already has the answer for um, the first graph in there for you to give you a feel of exactly how you're supposed to answer. So you don't have to go through and put words, and you probably should do the walking just to make sure you can replicate it and it's what the words say. But you go through and you just do that. Then you have each one after you have to describe with words until you get to the middle of page 13, and then it flips it and it gives words and you have to walk and make the graphs. And that's where you're gonna walk, make the graph, set the scale so you have just the part that fits the walking, take a picture with that snapshot tool so you have it over there and you'll be able to print when you're done. Make sure you label them so you know which one's person A, which one's person B. And then you go through and you do steps five, six, and seven. And then you have some questions after that. Unfortunately, we can't do the going further. So when you get to the end of question three, you'll be done. At that point, carefully tear the pages out of your notebook, staple them, leave them here, and go have a jolly Thursday night. Any questions? Yes. What do you want us to print? Um, when you print them, it will print them to the room 123 across the room.